A twist on the tale of the discoveries of Columbus, Copernicus, Bra, Kepler, and Galileo. Five individuals whose thoughts changed the world. And I want to talk about how the world may have also changed the way they thought. This is part one of four parts. The five individuals that I selected span about 120 years from 1480 to 1610, starting with Columbus, uh, Nicholas Copernicus, Tycho Brahe, Kepler, Johannes Kepler, and Galileo Galilei. And I hope that at the end of this talk, you realize why I chose these individuals to represent how the world had a great impact on the thoughts of these individuals and how these thoughts actually shaped the world. Europe in the 1200s. It's a very interesting place. The Eastern Roman Empire in Byzantium is very well established, whereas we have the beginning of the Papal Estates and the Western Roman Empire, which is also known as the Holy Empire. It will not be known as the Holy Roman Empire for about 200 years, but it's exactly what we understand as the Holy Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire was divided into Eastern and Western world, which is also called the Holy Empire. And we have in France a very strong establishment of the Frankish, Frankish lineage. It's the houses of Capet. And these all came from the uh, Carolingian branch of the family in the medieval times. And it's very well established, as you can see, for centuries is the same family or the same house that is governing France. What's happening is that Spain is not even Spain yet. It's a, it's a different association or neighborhood of kingdoms that are not ruled and as a unified country. We have Leon, Navarra, Castilla, we have Andalusia with the Moors, and we also have Aragon. So it's not even a country yet, and Portugal is just uh, being formed as an entity on the previous century. It's a very new country. In England, we have a, a bit more establishment of a, of a stable dynasty with the House of Anjou followed by the House of the Plantagenets uh, after a tumultuous previous centuries of different kind of conquests from anywhere after the Roman Empire left and we had the Angles and the Saxons and uh, the Utes and the Vikings, uh, etc. After the Normans arrived in England, there was some sort of a stabilization by the 1200s, as I mentioned, basically with the House of Plantagenet established in Europe. In the 1200s, the Holy Empire is divided in the East by Byzantium and the West, it's the Holy Roman Empire. And Europe is basically governed by church and the crown. The church has a very important influence after the medieval times. And it's basically a Christian church that has been established in the whole of Europe. And the local crown could be Kings, emperors, Caesars are called different names in different countries. Uh, princes, archdukes, but whichever it is, the crown, they actually govern together with the church. And what's happening in the 1200s is a focus on Jerusalem. And there's this idea that Jerusalem had to be reconquered for Christianity. Of course, this gave rise to the Crusades. The Crusades are spanning 200 years of uh, history that have actually created a lot of influence in the world as we see it today. The Crusaders came from Europe and they went to the Middle East 
And as I mentioned, during these 200 years, the nine crusades were opening the doors of Europe to Asia. And it actually created a new power. When these crusaders came back to their places of origin in Europe, they had power. They had developed a tremendous mercenary skill for fighting. And they also had riches that they brought from these Asian countries that they went through. And that created a very interesting situation in Europe where now the crusaders were starting to bring new ideas, new power, and establishing a slightly different social order in Europe. Europe in the 1300s sees a dramatic division of what was the Holy Roman Empire, although it's still governed by the Holy Roman Emperor. The different uh, strengths and powers that were brought by the Crusaders are creating different uh, areas of power. Uh, the Holy Roman Empire is still governed by a college of prince electors, but they actually work pretty much as a beginning of a democracy with discussions and with decisions that they have to make. It's still considered the crown and they still follow the church. But in the 1300s, besides the division of the Holy Roman Empire, of the Empire of the West, remember, the East Roman Empire in Byzantium is stable. But in the 1300s, the Western Roman Empire is divided. And it's also a little ice age in Europe that is affecting especially the northern countries. There's failures of crops. And on top of that, this uh, very important plague, the bubonic plague, is coming to Europe some people hypothesized it was brought by the Mongols with their uh, conquest of the of the Western world. And, you know, Europe is really suffering by so many different areas. Uh, the Crusaders, as I mentioned, had established a new power. They have brought the ability to fight as mercenaries, but they also brought riches from the East. And one of the things they also brought was the power of lending the money. There's the establishment of very important banking families. Some of them come from crusaders, although the Medici are the, mo uh, the best known bankers. And they did not come from a crusader lineage, which was pretty much seen as nouveau riche by the Pitti and the other families that were crusaders. But what happened is that they established this banking system whereby they had sister branches across Europe. And when people wanted to travel around Europe, it was not safe. Or even traveling to the uh, Holy Land in Jerusalem that had been opened now, um, the roads were not very safe to bring all your money with you. So what the Medici established was something similar to what the uh, Templars had done in the past. But the Medici established a very strong banking system with sister branches. And they would basically give you a note that would say this individual so-and-so has left, you know, 10 pounds of gold with my bank in, in the Medici branch of Hamburg. And with this note, the individual could go to other Medici branches uh, or even come to Florence in the central branch and say, you know, I have, you know, 10 pounds of gold in Hamburg. I want to cash now two pounds of gold. And so they would be issued a new note, a new bank note, and it would be deducting what they took plus a fee for what they mentioned was renting the space 
to keep the gold in the bank because usury was not appropriate and it was actually outlawed by the Christian church. So to avoid ch charges of usury, what they said was that they were really renting the space for keeping the gold safe. The system of Florentine banking was not unique to the Medici, but they definitely were the stronger ones. And they created a very strong lineage and family there based on the money that they were making. Uh, and they were making the travel safer for the individuals that were keeping their money in the Florentine banking. So the Crusaders have actually already by the 1300s brought a lot of Eastern culture. There's a lot of books, a lot of science, a lot of knowledge, mathematics, arithmetic. Uh, the games that they brought from Asia implied also a knowledge of mathematics based on system of 12 instead of a decimal system. And it's basically from the Assyrian system. We still have some of the measurements that date from the Assyrian system of 12, like when we measure hours, uh, which is based on 12 hours uh, in the middle of a day and, you know, 60 minutes per hour. So it's all divided by 12. And that's a, an Assyrian system of counting. But what happens here is that they brought all this knowledge and even though the Western Roman Empire has been divided, what we see is very strong dynasties in France. And uh, we have the Carolingians, the Plantagenets in England. And now Spain has been united with the House of Trastamara uh, that later on will join the House of Habsburg. The sword will become powerless against the thought and the florin. I like this, uh, this uh, quote, and I, I like to put it in there because it's true. They're, they're becoming uh, more and more focused on thinking and money. And this international trade of commodities is established, very well established now by the 1300s, where, you know, money and interest in science and knowledge is driving this force of bringing things to the West. The quote is from Harriet Rubin, Dante in Love. And the uh, very interesting book by John Freely that I have quoted there, Aladdin's Lamp, is also a very important book that explains a lot on this trade and how these commodities are coming through the uh, from the east through the Byzantium through the Byzantine Empire during the 1300s very stable coming through Byzantium all the way to the rest of Europe So we have in Europe of the 1400s an establishment of a trade from Asia. And this had been like via the Silk Road that it's uh, very famous for bringing the silk all the way from China to the Western European countries. But there's more than silk that they're bringing. And this establishment of the trade had now been very matured by the 1400s. However, with the fall of Byzantium, and the growth of the Ottoman Empire, this trade now has to go through Muslim territory and Ottoman territory. And of course, this is making a difficulty on the trade. And the trade is not only silk and spices, it's also knowledge. Uh, so the 1400 sees the birth of the Renaissance. And I'm going to read from this slide. It's a rediscovery of classical texts centering upon the individual's intellectual potential. Innovations in the fields of mathematics, medicine, engineering, architecture, and the arts are largely funded by the Medici. This is a quote from the Met Museum page. 
And I really like it because it does put together the interest of the Medici in science and in technological advancement beyond art, which we associate with Renaissance. But it was funded largely by the banking system the Medici had established from the middle of the 1300s. So the focus of learning from the East, bringing ideas from the philosophers is very important uh, and it has been established already when we have focus in science, philosophy and the arts. And of course, uh, with the growth of the Ottoman Empire, the courts now in Europe need access to this trade. Now, what were they bringing? They were bringing spices. This is a an image I put on the right in there is a blog for how to prepare mulled wine. Mulled wine had been now very uh, used in Europe. They were very getting very used to it, especially in the high courts of European countries. And the mulled wine basically used um, cloves, they used ginger, they could use saffron, they used nutmeg, star anise, all spices, and basically warmed up the wine. So they're getting very used to not only the silks, but also the spices. And in addition, there's a lot of other things coming from Asia in this trade uh, that's uh, very rich. It has changed the quality of life in Europe and they're getting very, very used to it. Now, what's happening in, in Europe in the 1400s is that only Wallachia is resisting in uh, the Ottoman invasion. In the 1400s, the prince uh, Dracul, his name was Vlad Tepesh, uh, was uh, the prince of Wallachia, and he resisted the Ottoman invasions. Uh, he's been more um, well known by Bram Stoker as a vampire, but Vlad Tepes was a real individual, and he was very Christian, and he was a defender of the faith and of Wallachia. So, you know, it was one of the countries in the Eastern European uh, geography that resisted the Ottoman Empire, and they had to go around him uh, to continue their conquest of the West. Now, what's happening in the eastern part of Europe is uh, uneasiness, it's uh, difficulty with the Ottoman Empire invasions and growth uh, of the Muslim faith and also the Ottoman Empire invasions and conquests. The uh, division of the Holy Roman Empire in many different uh, governments, estates. And as you come to the West, you start seeing a strengthening of especially Spain. You know, France has been very stable, but especially Spain by the 1400s has united uh, all of the different uh, neighboring uh, kingdoms had united into Castilla. They had also pushed the Moors to the kingdom of Granada. And in the middle of the 1400s, Castilla and Aragon will get married. Fernando de Aragon and Isabel de Castilla marry and they become the famous uh, king and queen, a Catholic king and queen of, of Spain. Uh, this strengthens Spain tremendously in the 1400s. And you also have a very stable uh, situation in France and Portugal, while in England, they're suffering from the Wars of the Roses. So coming to uh, Christopher Columbus, who, by the way, there's a lot of debate. Was he Genoese? Was he Portuguese? Was he Spanish? Uh, I believe there's strong evidence that he was Italian, probably from Genoa. And in, a, in any case, what happened is we see Europe and especially the Western countries in Europe very strong, Spain and Portugal. And these countries are becoming very strong. They're farther away from the Ottoman invasion and they are more stable. They have more wealth. So they're more focused on trying to get uh, the 
route for Asia that it's safe because things are coming through Europe, going through the Ottoman Empire and getting taxed as they come along to their countries. So evidently having a more direct route to Asia that can avoid the Ottoman Empire is instrumental. So in his plan, what uh, Christopher Columbus probably had to present to the different kingdoms that were stable in Europe was, this is the goal, getting a safe route to Asia uh, so that the commodities can come back and be less expensive. Um, also, it would be less dangerous. So state the purpose of the goal, let's avoid the Ottoman Empire to lower the cost of the Asian imports. So what is the idea that he brought to these different kingdoms? We do know that he spent uh, more than a decade trying to obtain a government, uh, one of these crowns of Europe, to agree on his plans. The last ones that he approached were the Kingdom of Spain, and it was actually the Queen of Castilla, Isabel, the one who agreed on funding him. But he was bringing this to several different kingdoms. And what he said is, okay, I'm going to sail west to reach Asia. And that way I don't have to go east through the Ottoman Empire. So how would he do it? And he already had in his proposal the idea of using the, car the carabelas. The carabelas were a novelty in terms of the engineering for these kind of ships. They, they were extremely, extremely fast. This kind of triangular shaped uh, sail, I am told, I don't know that for a fact, but apparently it's easier to maneuver. And they were able to actually cover more space. And although nowadays we see them as small vessels, for the time, they were rather large vessels for the general European standards of these um, uh, kind of uh, boats that could sail in the Atlantic. So he creates an action plan. He specifies, you know, I need three carab carabelas, I need sailors, I need a doctor, I need mariners. And of course, he would need supplies. He would need minimum needs for the estimated time he would be spending at sea. Anything that they needed in that carabela uh, had to be sufficient because they had no idea how long they were going to be in the middle of the ocean. So including the drinking water, they had to make all these estimates and all these calculations, which were part of the plans that Columbus was bringing to the different kingdoms for support. So once he had all these ready, he had to obtain the financial support to do this. And it was actually through Luis de Santangel, who was an advisor in the court of Isabel de Castilla. Uh, apparently, he was the one who basically funded Columbus's uh, enterprise. There's several different documentations and paperwork that even though Isabel agreed, she did not really commit to giving the money up front, knowing the risks. And it was Luis de Santangel, the one who provided his own money from his own family wealth uh, in return, of course, in documentation of what would be the return of the investment uh, should Columbus actually achieve arriving into Asia to bring these uh, commodities to Spain. And so finally, once Columbus was able, after I said it's probably over a decade of uh, convincing, you know, refining his plan and bringing all these together to conduct the plan. So what happened? Uh, did he do the wrong planning and estimates? And why am I saying this? Well, the supplies that he had were barely sufficient to reach America. Uh, we all know that, you know, the story goes that it was the last day when they finally saw America. They had drank they had almost finished all the drinking water. They didn't have any more food and there was almost a mutiny there. He didn't definitely have the sufficient supplies to turn around. And he was just hoping he would find land that day uh, 
apparently in his diary, he does explain that he would be a dead man if they don't see it. And so what happened? He was actually thinking that he was going to be arriving in China. But he's midway when he reaches America and he ran out of all of his supplies. So was the information accurate in 1492? Uh, in terms of the distance that he had to travel west. So did he underestimate the size of the world? And he thought the time that he had calculated to reach China was appropriate. And we now know that he was not even halfway there. Or did he actually lack the knowledge? How did he calculate that he could reach China in 10 weeks traveling by caravel? Well, did he actually lack the skills? Uh, did he have little experience sailing and didn't know uh, the speed at sea that he was going to need? And could he actually achieve it? He did know uh, the caravel speeds. He did have a good estimate for how far the caravel could take them. And he seemed to have an experienced sailor from what we know about him, although there's very little known about him before his um, discovery of America. So what happened? Did he actually lie about what he knew? Did he know that there was land closer to China? And he was just telling everybody he was going to be reaching China. So let's take a look at the first concept. Did he know uh, how big the earth was? Well, in 200 before Christ, Eratosthenes, a Greek astronomer, had actually calculated the circumference of the world. And by the way, they did know that the world was a sphere. So what he did was to calculate it based on a whale uh, near Aswan. And what he assumed is if the, uh, the sun rays are parallel, let's say if it's a flat world, this is the way that I would see it in the well. And this is the way that I would see it in a pole in Alexandria. But when he saw actually how the rays of the sun were coming uh, comparing from the well the trajectory of the actual sun rays and the pole in Alexandria, he just extrapolated the two lines and then he did calculate the circumference of the world. He calculated 252,000 states, which roughly translates to about 24,663 to 27,967 miles. Now, uh, today, the accepted figure for this circumference is very close to this number. It's very close to 25,000. So he really was very accurate, and this was before Christ. So the information was there. They actually did know not only how big the world was, but they had a very good idea of the distance that they had to travel. So now that we know the information was pretty accurate, and Columbus could not have underestimated the size of the world because this was known. So did he lack the knowledge? And, you know, he did sail and reach the Bahamas uh, from the 3rd of August to October 12th in the Julian calendar, of course. And so how did he actually say that he would reach China in only 10 to 12 weeks? Did he think that the caravel speed was going to be faster. This is a possibility, although unlikely, because it would have to really be much than twice faster. And that would have been really hard to understand. So this is unlikely. Uh, in terms of his skills, it seems that he did have experience and he had a, a, a very good understanding of sailing. So, you know, we're left to believe that maybe he lied about what he knew. Did he know that there was land closer than China? Now, there seems to be a lot of evidence from the Viking sagas and uh, some maps that have been found of uh, the territory called Vinland that was discovered by 
um, Leif Erikson, the son of Eric the Red. And th there seems to be now some evidence that the Vikings did know that they could travel west and do several stopovers from Iceland and Greenland, etc. So they would go around, not always, always not very far from land, and that there was land on the west. And they called it Vinland because they saw a lot of vines and it was a very good territory. We, we now know it's lands or meadows in Newfoundland and the Viking settlements have been discovered and archaeology has actually uncovered them and they they date from the very early uh, 10th uh, I think 11th century so it is very likely that by the time of Columbus the good mariners and good navigators knew about this and that he actually did not go that blind into his uh exploration to the West, he probably did not want to say specifically, I want to go to this new territory. But, you know, he did have to sell his product by saying, I am going to reach China because it was the Asian imports, what people were looking for. So when we summarize uh, what is in a very high level, the situation with uh, Columbus, we know that he did obtain the appropriate uh, funding for reaching the Americas and he had the appropriate uh, resources that he needed. He probably, most likely, knew the circumference of the earth. This was no uh, secret and it was very well known. He used the carabelas. He did request them. So his calculations included uh, the speed that he was going to be uh, going into the Atlantic, and he did know how many carabelas he needed and how many people he needed for these, ex uh, for these exploration. And finally, uh, most likely he did know and had heard from these sagas, from these uh, different places in the West, and that people had done it in the past. The mariners used to uh, gather in public houses. They used to talk about uh, the most recent explorations. And it's no uh, secret that all of these word of mouth could have come to them, especially as big mariners that came from different places in Europe. So it is very likely, let's say it's more probable than not, that he did know about these lands and all of his calculations considered going west to these new lands. So Christopher Columbus is the explorer of the unknown. He is very good at understanding that he needs to present the alternative route to Asia, avoiding the Ottoman Empire, to the people that will actually fund him. Even though he's driven by the exploration, he understands he needs to put a uh, value in terms of price value so that he gets funded. He needs to offer something attractive and he also needs to come to the right place to offer so that he can get the funds that he needs for his exploration. He takes calculated risks. He just doesn't go uh, you know, blinded. He takes into account all available data. Uh, like I mentioned, he most likely knew about the calculations of the world circumference, the speed of the carabels, the need for using carabels was very clear in his uh, proposals, how many carabels, uh, what he needed in terms of money and in terms of the um, resources that he was going to take into them and the, the men that he was going to take. So he has a plan, but it's still the unknown. And he does know he needs to find the appropriate audience that will pay attention and pay for it. So he needs to put the spin on it on why would you pay for me to go west? And of course, in Spain, there's more stability compared to France or England that's going through the War of the Roses and a lot of civil war uh, engagements and issues. 
uh, Spain is getting stronger. Spain has consolidated uh, with Castilla and Aragon under the Trastamara reign. And uh, Spain finally decides to fund the enterprise at risk, but with great gains. Uh, the documents that actually show the contract were very clear into saying, okay, you know, Spain had become wealthy, Spain was strong, but they were not just freely giving the money away. There was a return of investment that was required, and Columbus did have to bring back uh, what he was promising or an alternative. So it is very interesting how this contract was made, but he got into the right place after decades of trying with different crowns and different different uh, heads of state. So his first um, attempt, and actually he sailed from Portugal. Portugal had a very long history already established of navigators uh, Enrique el Navegante, he is a prince. He's the son of a king and then later the youngest brother of the next king. And he was a navigator, an explorer. By 1426, uh, under his tutelage and leadership, uh, Portugal actually had already landed in the Azores Islands, which is in the middle of the Atlantic, of the North Atlantic, although, you know, halfway to America. So he knew about the the world, the circumference, the speed, and all of these things in Portugal were very well known. They were very skilled, which is one of the reasons why probably um, Columbus used a Portuguese crew and the Portuguese navigators for his three carabelas, because there was a very well known track record of them. Uh, after Enrique el Navegante, we know about Fernando de Magallanes, called Magellan in English, uh, who in by 1519 had sailed around Africa. He left Portugal, went around Africa. Uh, that's the way he reached the Indies and China for trading with Portugal, but he went ahead continuing east. And his expedition uh, reportedly is the first one that actually goes around the world. Uh, of course, he didn't make it. He died before he finished. And it was Juan Sebastián Elcano, the captain that actually ended up returning uh, to Barrameda in uh, at the end of this round the world trip, but this was the Magellan expedition. So Portugal was well known as great navigators. The skills were there. Columbus knew them. Columbus had approached them and Columbus actually did go to Portugal uh, with the Hermanos Pinzon for his navigation. So with all of this said, there were a lot of things that he knew. There were a lot of things that he put together, but we shouldn't uh, undermine his spirit of exploration. In summary, what I see about Christopher Columbus is that he's truly the explorer of the unknown. There may have been a lot of information, a lot of data that he used to create his plan. Uh, let's not undermine that he really went into uncharted territories. Uh, he was driven by a love of exploration. He must have been a very good leader, but also somebody that actually is driven by the unknown, by the testing of new things, uh, of trying new technologies. And, you know, he looked for the appropriate sponsorship. It took him a long time. It wasn't easy, but he was willing to take risks and go beyond. In my mind, a big difference between what Columbus achieved and previous Europeans that may have reached America, like the Vikings, is that Columbus established a dialogue. Uh, what he wanted, his goal, I think, went really beyond uh, just the fact of reaching uh, a land to the West. He really established a dialogue between America and Europe. He wanted to be that bridge in between, uh, you know, 
begin a new trade that goes both ways. And that is something that culturally uh, created uh, the, the wonderful um, opening of the world beyond what other smaller settlements may have done in the past. So that's, you know, in a nutshell is the way that I see Columbus is as a great explorer of the unknown. Thank you for listening. Uh, this is the end of part one of four parts. And uh, the recommended sources are for the whole four part um, video. So I hope that you can return. And there's a little surprise at the end of part four. I think it's the most fun part of it. So stay tuned and go on to part two. Thank you.